millions of records I could break for demonstration. Possibly, my mind is startled at its thought, I could fly non-stop between New York and Paris. Hello, I'm Bob Trout, here with another story in Stamps. Those were the thoughts, the dreams, recorded here of a young airmail pilot named Charles Lindbergh as he flew his flimsy de Havilland biplane from St. Louis to Chicago one September night in 1926. His vision of the future of aviation was shared by very few others. In the public mind, the airplane was an invention fit only for carrying freight and fools. No sane businessman would give a second thought to risking capital in such a venture as a commercial airline. What changed their minds? Let's begin at the beginning. This 1949 airmail stamp commemorated the 46th anniversary of the Wright brothers' first flight, December 17, 1903, a year after Lindbergh was born. This 1934 French issue marks a monument in aviation history. On July 25, 1908, Blériot crossed the English Channel from Calais to Dover, ending forever England's isolation from the continent of Europe. All thinking about national boundaries had to be revised. As usual, war compressed within a few years, technical advances that might otherwise have taken decades. Overnight, the airplane became the eyes of the army, scouting, observing, directing artillery fire, photographing, bombing enemy installations. Speed and range increased phenomenally and the war trained hundreds of pilots who, when they returned home, became devoted missionaries in the cause of aviation. On the night of May 16, 1919, three United States Navy seaplanes took off from Newfoundland. Fifteen hours and 18 minutes later, one of them, the NC-4, put down in the harbor of Horta in the Azores. The others, lost, forced down at sea, badly damaged, unable to continue. Lieutenant Commander Albert C. Reed and his crew were received enthusiastically by the people of England, France, and Portugal. But coming home to the United States was a depressing experience. As Commander Reed remarked bitterly, although considerable interest was manifested in the U.S., that interest did not extend to the point of furnishing financial backing for the needs of aviation. Airplanes to carry passengers? No one could see it. When it came to carrying mail, the government had to put up the money. In 1918, the first air mail service was inaugurated between Washington, Philadelphia, and New York. And this was the first air mail stamp. 24 cents. It showed a Curtis Jenny in flight. The first few sheets of these stamps, as a matter of fact, showed Jenny flying upside down. Those stamps with the inverted centers are worth something like $4,000 each today. After the war, a lot of Jennies were sold as government surplus. The pilots who bought them came to be known as barnstormers, gypsy flyers, flying fools. All over the country, they put on shows walking the wings of a plane hundreds of feet up, jumping off with parachutes that sometimes fail to open, throwing their frail craft into loops, spins, dives, risking their necks for the benefit of the farmers, shopkeepers, housewives, and children who watched in awe on the ground below. Why did they do it? One of them tried to explain it many years later. He wrote, there was a desire I could not explain. It was the quality that led me into aviation in the first place, when safer and more profitable occupations were at hand. It lay beyond the descriptive words of men, where immortality is touched through danger, where life, where man is more than man, 
and existence both supreme and valueless at the same instant. That's how Charles Lindbergh tried to explain it in his book, The Spirit of St. Louis. It was as a barnstorming parachutist, wing walker, and stunt pilot that he first learned to fly. Later, he went through the Army flying schools at Brookfield and Kelly Field and began flying the mail from St. Louis to Chicago and to dream of flying nonstop from New York to Paris. He knew it was possible. He knew he could do it. He needed money and a plane. By December of 1926, Lindbergh had found eight St. Louis citizens who were willing to back him financially. In February of 1927, he told Ryan Airlines to go ahead and build the plane. Others were getting ready to try. Lieutenant Commander Richard E. Byrd was readying a huge three-engine Fokker monoplane. Lieutenant Commander Noel Davis planned to use a tri-motored Keystone Pathfinder biplane. In Paris, Captain Charles Nungesser, World War I ace, expected to make the flight from Europe to America in a single-engine plane. Clarence Chamberlain and Bert Acosta broke the endurance record that Lindbergh had hoped to break. And now they, too, were planning a transatlantic flight. The others were all ready. Lindbergh's plane was still under construction. Bird's plane crashed at Teterboro Airport. Davis and his co-pilot killed. Nungesser was the only one left. The French flyers were never found. Eleven days later, his plane tested and flown from San Diego to New York without mishap. Charles Lindbergh watched it being towed, dripping wet in the early morning rain, from Curtis Field to Roosevelt Field for the long-awaited takeoff. Escorted by motorcycle police, reporters, mechanics, and a handful of onlookers, it looked, as he wrote later, more like a funeral procession than the beginning of a flight to Paris. The oversized tanks in wings, nose, and fuselage were filled with fuel. At 7.40 a.m., the engine started. Final interviews were held, last-minute pictures snapped. And at 7.52, the spirit of St. Louis began to roll down the muddy runway. Would it get off the ground, or would it crash at the end of the runway? Twice its wheels left the ground, only to return. And then, the plane was airborne. It was 7.54 Eastern Daylight Time, the morning of May 20th, 1927, 3,600 miles to Paris. An hour later, over Rhode Island, the Atlantic Ocean less than 30 minutes away, Cape Cod, and stretching ahead, the limitless expanse of water. Lindbergh wrote, I'm giving up a continent and heading out to sea in the most fragile vehicle ever devised by man. Over Nova Scotia, rain lashed the wings, seeped into the cockpit. The wind took the plane in its teeth and shook it as a dog shakes a rabbit. Over Newfoundland, where eight years before, the big Navy flying boats had started their voyage across the Atlantic. This would be his last sight of land for 2,000 miles. As it grew darker and colder, first the fog came, and then mountainous thunderheads. Through haze so thick that only the stars directly overhead were visible, he wove in and out among the clouds. He fought the storm, the fog, and the desire to sleep, doubting his ability to endure, knowing that the alternative was death and failure. And finally, he broke the spell. The crisis passed. He was wide awake. It was 7.52 a.m. New York time. Three hours later, he spied the fishing boats and knew that he was nearing land. He glided down and shouted as loudly as he could, which way is Ireland? 
the crew just gaped. Within the hour, he saw in the distance a rugged coastline, a bay, a village, the southwestern coast of Ireland, two hours ahead of schedule and almost exactly on his route. He set his course southeastward toward England, the Channel, Cherbourg, and Paris. Yesterday, he exulted, each strip of sea I crossed was an advanced messenger of the ocean. Today, these islands down below are heralds to a continent. At 10 o'clock, 5 New York time, he saw the lights of Paris. He saw the hangars, the roads jammed with cars. Safely on the ground, he had barely cut the engine when the crowd reached the plane. They shouted his name over and over again, Lindbergh, Lindbergh. And when he opened the door of his cockpit, dozens of hands seized him and carried him off. Charles Lindbergh had unleashed a torrent of mass emotion, the like of which has never been witnessed. He had proved to the world, once and for all, that airplanes really could fly. Governments all over the world issued stamps in his honor. Lindbergh awakened the world to the possibilities of flight. Well, that's today's story. Just one of many stories of the world through stamps I'd like to tell you. Nice to have been with you, and I hope you'll come back soon. So long now.